Get off my fucking TV and save me the misery. And all you fucking goons, just grab a cold beer. The man of the hour is finally here. J.D. from New York, 206. It's time for off the script. J.D. What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. On is the only fucking way I can start the podcast off, sick or not, because this is the number one fucking podcast. In your subscription box, right here on YouTube.com. This is Off The Script, episode 126, part number one for your Friday, July 15th, 2016, man. I gotta get you guys hyped. No matter how bad I'm feeling, I gotta get you guys hyped for this show Every single weekend, man. Thank you guys so much for everything. There's a few things I want to go over in the beginning of this video before we get into the news. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you, first off, for the incredible week that we've had. Real talk, this has been the best growth I've ever seen on this channel. And I love the momentum that we have developed. And I hope to see that continue, man. My, my main goal for 2016 is to hit 100,000 subscribers. If I don't get there, I'm not going to be terribly upset, but I at least want to be within striking distance before this year is over. Because I think we have something special here. I think the brand I have created has really made a name for itself uh, in the YWC, and I thank you guys for the continued love and support, and I thank all the new people that have come over and subscribed. If you love WWE, this truly is the channel for you guys. So I want to thank you guys. I don't do it enough. Thank you guys for everything and the incredible week that we've had growth-wise right here on the channel. Number two, the Cruiserweight Classic and NXT. We had some amazing wrestling on Wednesday night. If you guys watched that, if you watched Balor versus Nakamura, if you watched the Cruiserweight Tournament begin on Wednesday with the Cruiserweight Classic, I did review that. I did review both of those shows a little bit more on the Cruiserweight side than I did NXT because we knew what was going to happen with NXT and we knew Nakamura was going to go on and pretty much defeat Finn Balor and hopefully go on to NXT Brooklyn number two to fight for the WWE NXT Championship. So that happened. But I did talk about the Cruiserweight Tournament and the Cruiserweight Classic, the beginning, week one. Uh, go check that out, man. Beautiful review on that. I was really excited for it. Unbelievable one-hour block of wrestling for the Cruiserweight Classic. So if you missed that, link will be down below. Uh, in the description, and I'll put an annotation on the screen for you guys right there as well. I will also go in-depth about all that stuff on the iTunes podcast this weekend, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Make sure you subscribe to me on Podbean and iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Audio Boom, and Google Play Music, so make sure you guys look out for that as well, okay? I do have a video coming later today, another wrestling-related video. We're going to talk about NXT and NXT Brooklyn. Back to Brooklyn is what they're calling it. The entire card has been leaked. And I do a side-by-side -side comparison of this year's TakeOver Brooklyn compared to last year's TakeOver Brooklyn. Very in-depth video. Very, very good video. I want you guys to check that out later today. It should be going up around 3, 4 p.m. So make sure you guys tune right into the channel so you don't miss that video. I also talked about the WWE 2K17 NXT. A lot of NXT this week. NXT getting a lot of love this week. That's fucking great. Uh, WW2K17 and the NXT Collector's Edition that will include Shinsuke Nakamura, Apollo Crews, and Nia Jax as playable characters for pre-order. I made a video on that. Something that you guys might have missed in that reveal trailer that would probably or possibly unveil more NXT talent and superstars that are going to be in the game like Bayley, Alexa Bliss, American Alpha, The Revival... So make sure you guys go check that video out. As always, link will be down below and an annotation on the screen right in front of you, okay? 
And most importantly, guys, before I get into my, my usual plugs, and I know there'll be some fucking goon in the comments. Uh, skip here. Skip here. JD, where's the newsman? Where, where's the newsman? Give me a fucking break, man. It's my podcast. Go listen to Jim Ross. Before you even turn the fucking thing on, there's advertisements. And then 20 minutes in, he's still fucking talking about shit that he's got going on. It's just the way the podcast world works, man. But this is very important because it has to do something with real life, okay? My best friend, Sean, who I went down to Atlantic City recently to go watch UFC 200 with. I've known him uh, for many, many years now. He's the, one, he's the one guy that has pretty much stuck with me. Uh, and he hasn't left my side. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you do this YouTube thing, you know, you lose friends along the way. There's a lot of people that I have become very, very good friends with doing this. And I don't talk to them anymore. For whatever reason, they just went about their own way, doing their own thing, have completely abandoned YouTube. They don't fucking care about anything that's going on anymore. And they just ride off into the sunset, living their own life, having kids, getting married, fuck gaming. They don't give a shit about anything that's happening on social media anymore. Okay, and not only with the people that I've met on YouTube, but the people that I know in real life here, my, my, my real life friends, you know, I, I mentioned this on the podcast on iTunes this past week, because I came back from Jersey from visiting Sean, and it got me thinking that I don't have any real friends at all, man. I barely have anybody here in New York that I see anymore at all. I don't, I don't legit have like friends to call up and say, bro, you want to go hang out and have a beer? You want to go to the bar, have a beer? I got my brother, but that's about it. And I say that because it's true. Most of my good friends now are online friends like, like Joe and all his crew and everybody that listens to me. But Sean is the one real life friend that has pretty much stuck with me and hasn't abandoned me and has shown no signs of ever disrespecting me and I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon because he's just that good of a fucking human being and he's a hard working dude and he's got three kids and he works two full time jobs to make ends meet at home to, su to support his kids and he came to me and he told me that he wants to lose weight he wants to lose weight because he doesn't feel good about himself and he told me he wants to start a YouTube channel. And I told him that's a fantastic idea. And automatically, I said, dude, just, you know, let me know when you want to start it. I'll hook you up. I'll get people watching you. I'll get people to fucking know who you are. You know, you know he wanted to take a step back because his self-esteem right now, being in front of the camera, isn't really all that high. He, he wants to get used to it first, which I completely understand. You guys got to go back and watch my older videos, man. You don't, you don't even fucking recognize who I am. If you listen to uh, my shit back in the day, it's unreal. But he came to me and told me he wants to start a YouTube channel. And his YouTube channel is going to be about him. It's going to be about the things that he likes. Beer, Dragon Ball Z. But the main thing that he's going to focus on for right now is him losing weight. And I'm not sure if you guys listening to me, if you have a weight problem or a weight issue and you don't have that high of self-esteem, and you don't feel very good about yourself, he's going to document his journey, going to the gym, dieting. He's going to show you how he plans to lose weight, the meals that he makes, the drinks that he makes, the, the new take on life that he goes through. He's going to document all this because he wants to feel good about himself again, and he wants to make people feel good about him. Uh, he wants to make people feel good about themselves as well. And it's going to be great. And all I ask of you is, every time I mention something on here, this is a platform to help. Remember when we helped Pico? We helped Pico go to Atlanta and win a fucking fashion contest. And he became a new man. We helped Pico blow away the competition as far as votes go. And he was chosen because of this very show. Justin Bailey made the intro to this fucking very podcast. He was at like 700, 800 subs. He's now nearing 1,400 subs on YouTube. We gained him 700 subs in one week. That might not be a lot, being that we're a 56,000 subscriber channel, but not everybody really listens to what I say. But the core people, 
the people that really respect me and what I do here and this show and trust me, they went over and subscribed to Justin and they're enjoying themselves. And I'm going to ask you guys for help once again. I'm going to leave you his link down below. I'm going to leave you the link to my buddy Sean's channel down below. I want you to go subscribe to him. He's got 35 subs right now. I just got off the phone with him before I hit record on this podcast. I told him, dude, I will try to get you as close to a thousand as I possibly can. And that's what I want you guys to do. Everybody listening to me off the script gets 75,000 views plus every single weekend between Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Everybody listening to me, and I will mention this every fucking show I do this weekend. I want you to go help Sean out. Not only because I want you to see his journey in making himself feel better, but because you trust me, and this is someone that has never left my side, that I consider my best friend, and I want you to help him out. That's all I ask. I ask you guys for Patreon. I ask you guys if you want to donate to the show to help the cause, to build my brand. All that stuff is an obligation. You do it if you want. I'm asking you as Jerry to go and subscribe to Sean because to him this is important. To me, this is important. And if he can help himself while helping others, that's a win-win situation, man. So I'm going to leave you the link down below. I want you guys to go subscribe to him. Show him some support. Show him some love. Tell him I sent you. And let's get his journey on the way, man. Seriously, he's a great personality. He's got, he's got an absolute knack for doing this, man. He can be big on YouTube if he applies himself and he wants to. Because he's got a great personality. He's a great human being. So go out there, help him out. And off the script, show the power. Show everyone the power of what we do here, man. Not only do we know WWE, not only are we an entertaining brand, not only are we an entertaining podcast, but I want to help some people out too, man. So make sure you guys go ch check him out, show him some love, and tell him that I sent you, man. Thank you guys so much. Barbershop Window, Patreon.com if you guys want to support the show. Twitter, sus uh, Twitter at JD from NY206, and subscribe to the channel, man. I don't know what you're waiting for. Thank you guys so much for all of that. Let's get into the news now, man. We got a big story right here. Apparently, Vince McMahon is no longer high on Roman Reigns, and he's giving Roman Reigns push to other WWE superstars. I will believe this when I actually see it on WWE television. But the report states, WWE bet big on Roman Reigns when Seth Rollins went down with an injury in November. We all know that Roman Reigns was supposed to go one-on-one -on -one with Seth Rollins and that Seth Rollins was supposed to drop the title to Roman Reigns at the Survivor Series. They went in some weird, convoluted, fucked-up way coming out of the Survivor Series and it really didn't do anybody any good. They hurt a lot more people than anything coming out of the Survivor Series. In a way, WWE had to do it, but it was ultimately what they wanted to do, so it all worked out for them. That was until a few weeks ago, when Roman Reigns violated the WWE wellness policy and was essentially forced to drop the WWE title to Seth Rollins at Money in the Bank. Apparently, the punishment won't stop there for Roman Reigns. Sure, WWE is done punishing him for his mistake. But Vince McMahon losing faith in his top star is going to be a long-lasting punishment because Vince is said to be lower on reins than he ever has before. According to a report from DailyWrestlingNews.com, Roman Reigns failing the wellness policy right before the WWE draft and brand extension has put him under fire with Vince McMahon. The word is that Vince was already souring towards him as the top star before the wellness policy, so it was much easier for him after he had a legitimate reason to knock Roman Reigns off his pedestal. Apparently, both AJ Styles and Seth Rollins are very high on Vince McMahon's list to be his top superstars for Raw and SmackDown, which, if I was to make a bet and be a gambling man, I think Seth Rollins is going to be the number one pick for Raw, and I think AJ Styles is going to be the number one pick for SmackDown. That's just the way I see it, and you can build from there. John Cena is going to be on SmackDown. Roman Reigns is going to be on Raw. 
And then Dean Ambrose, if I was to choose Dean Ambrose as well, I, like I said, in the past I would put all three former members of the Shield on Monday Night Raw because I think they all need to be together, especially if WWE wants to do this reunion of the Shield that everybody's been talking about all year. You can build up to something special, especially if all the Bullet Club is on SmackDown and you want to, and you want to eventually feud them with the reformation of the shield that would be a special attraction coming out of this draft especially being that both raw and smackdown will be completely separate from one another when it does happen and all those circumstances are really in play it's going to make it feel a lot more special when it happens because of the brand split okay so vince mcmahon knocked him off his pedestal aj Styles, seth rollins very high on vince mcmahon's radar those are probably going to be the top two picks come the draft on July 19th for Raw and SmackDown. He's always been high on Seth Rollins, but he was claiming that he should have signed AJ Styles 10 years ago. Oh, now Vince McMahon is opening up to AJ Styles. Everybody's been talking about how great AJ Styles was for years and how he is the greatest wrestler in the world right now. Arguably the greatest wrestler because there's a lot of great talent out there. AJ Styles probably in the top three if you want to start naming best wrestlers in the entire world, okay? And WWE has two of the three in their company right now. You got Nakamura, and you got AJ Styles. You could probably add Sami Zayn to that list as well. So WWE is, is unbelievable with talent right now. Unbelievable with talent right now. And this is the reason why I get pissed. This is the reason why I go off on these fucking rants. Look at the fucking talent these guys got. And you mean to tell me we get Monday Night Raw the way we get it every Monday with the fucking talent they, that they possess? Give me a break, man. Sheer laziness on WWE. But he's claiming now, after all this time, and especially that AJ Styles was a TNA guy, and he was supposed to be the face of Impact Wrestling, now he's stating, oh, I should have signed AJ Styles 10 years ago. So when Jim Ross goes on the Ross Report and says, you know, I should have signed AJ Styles when I had the chance, I fucked up. Whose fault was it? Was it Vince McMahon? Whispering to Jim Ross? Because if you listen to the Ross Report, if you go back and listen to the Ross Report when AJ Styles was on Jim Ross's show, Jim Ross adamantly and openly admitted that he fucked up in not signing AJ Styles, that he let AJ Styles walk. Because Jim Ross was the talent relations guy. He was in charge of going out and getting the talent. Jim Ross's name is linked to so many of the greats back when wrestling was actually fucking great. The Rock... Kurt Angle, Brock Lesnar, the list goes on and on. So Jim Ross knew and had an idea of what talent should have been in the WWE. AJ Styles was one of those guys. So I don't know what happened there. Obviously, everything goes through Vince McMahon. So what makes WWE and Vince McMahon now more open to AJ Styles than he was back then? I don't know. I really don't understand. Because AJ Styles is now a more seasoned veteran. Because AJ Styles now has pretty much walked into the WWE and done something that nobody really expected him to do. Shut everybody's fucking mouth up. All he had to do was step into the ring. And this is what I constantly say each and every fucking week. The in-ring work of these guys is enough to get them over. Yes, they need personality. Yes, they need to be an engaging superstar. But with guys like Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens and all these fucking reports coming out, these guys aren't superstars, according to some. That's what I want to see. People telling me after the Cruiserweight Classic, oh, it's boring. You can't build a story off in-ring action by itself. Why not? Why not? You can't sit at home and watch two guys compete in a fucking tournament to crown a new Cruiserweight champion. You don't find that enough, to be, enough of a story to be engaging. 32 men from around the world in one fucking tournament. You don't find a story there. What do you want to have happen? You want cheating girlfriends and fucking soap operas and general hospital type bullshit on WWE? Huh? I don't understand you fucking people. That's enough of a storyline for me. NXT has the most simplistic fucking storylines. The most simplistic storylines. And they get it done. And then every time we see TakeOver... People are always, always, always hyped for what we see. Because after all that, all that simplistic storytelling that they do, 
They take a page from the old school WWF days. All that simplistic storyline comes to a head. And all we care about in the end is how great of a match these guys are going to have. Nakamura and Samoa Joe are going to be fighting at TakeOver. That's the main event for TakeOver, back to Brooklyn in August. SummerSlam weekend. How much of a storyline can they build with Nakamura when he doesn't even speak the language completely? So you've got to read the spoilers and see that not in one instance, and I'm going to spoil this for you guys because I really don't give a shit. Because I got the video coming out later, you guys know what's going to happen at NXT TakeOver Back to Brooklyn. In every instance, Nakamura evaded Samoa Joe. They did not let Nakamura or Joe touch each other the entire time for this build. I read through weeks of fucking spoilers, weeks of shows. And every instance, Nakamura never put his hands on Joe. Never. That's the way you build a match. Now, some may say, oh, that's boring. There's no, there's no heat between the two. There's no conflict between the two. Where's the storytelling here, bro? I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. Because today is July 15th. We got NXT TakeOver back to Brooklyn in a little bit more than a month. You think I'm going to give a shit about storytelling? And the fact that Nakamura didn't put his hands on Samoa Joe or vice versa all month for this build? Because when we get to the match, we're all going to be fucking sitting at the edge of our seat. Like fucking little children. Awaiting the ice cream truck to fucking roll by the block. It's going to be great. It doesn't matter. The in-ring work of these guys will get over. And that's exactly what AJ Styles' mentality was going in here. And you know what? He succeeded. And he shut everybody up. He wasn't the most engaging personality. He wasn't the most fucking outward superstar. He wasn't gleaming with charisma. He was a decent promo. He's got that southern accent coming from TNA. TNA guy thought he was going to get buried just like Christian Cage was when he came to the WWE. Vince McMahon never seen anything in Christian. Everybody thought that was going to be the same fate for AJ Styles. Now look. Now Vince McMahon is going back on his word. Hmm, who's wrong here, Vince? Are the fans wrong? Or are you admitting you're wrong? I don't know. I don't know why I went on that rant. I, I don't know. Completely straight away from the fucking story about Roman Reigns. But you can see how much certain things bother me. You know? The things that people say. And the hip hypocrisy of Vince McMahon and the WWE. Now they're stating, oh, oh we should have signed AJ Styles 10 years ago. No shit you should have signed him 10 years ago. Can you imagine if he was in the WWE 10 years ago? The matches that we would have got. Brian Styles. Rollin Styles. Angle Styles. Fucking The Rock versus Styles. Jesus Christ. So I'm glad he's in the WWE now, but... You know, Vince McMahon doesn't always make the right decisions. That certainly is one of them. Moving on here, after that rant, especially with top NXT superstars coming to the main roster with the draft, Reigns is going to have a tough climb back to the top of WWE's ladder. The biggest issue that Roman Reigns is going to face is competing with guys like Rollins and Styles while top talent from NXT comes to the WWE's main roster. For example, Finn Balor's debut in WWE has been imminent for months now. But WWE officials have been waiting for the right time to bring him to Raw and SmackDown. Balor is destined to be a massive superstar for WWE. And this is another thing that people really fucking got under my skin about. OJD oh, Balor is boring. He's all fluff. He's not like he was back in New Japan. All he is in WWE is an entrance. And that's it. Really now. Yeah, okay. So, you're downplaying Balor's talent because he isn't in New Japan. Why? Because he's a WWE guy now? Because he has a legit character now in WWE? You're going to downplay the guy's fucking talent. Have you been watching the WWE product for the last two years? I can give you one instance that Balor's been in this year. He took a feud with Samoa Joe and he built it over eight months, and it was still refreshing by month eight 
as it was in month one. I want you to find a WWE main roster program that lasted eight months and still kept your interest. WWE's given us Rusev versus Titus O'Neil five times in three weeks. That's how WWE operates. So for the simple fact that Samoa Joe and Finn Balor gave us a program of three matches in eight months and still kept it fucking fresh after eight months, that's an attribute to how great Finn Balor is. That's an attribute to how great Samoa Joe is. But Finn Balor sucks though, right? Finn Balor's boring in the ring, right? Yeah, let me, let me see you guys watch the Nakamura match. Obviously, it wasn't the best match of the year, okay? It was a fucking four-star match to me. People ask me, JD, what did you think better? What you what you think was better, Nakamura and Balor, or what he did with Zane and with Zane and Austin Aries? I'm gonna tell you that the match with Balor was third out of those two matches. The Zane match was the best out of all, and then the Aries match. And even those matches are great in their own right. The Zane match with Nakamura was the best of of the three matches because of the atmosphere that was at WrestleMania. And it was Zayn's last match. And people knew that. And it was the debut of, of Nakamura. And the entrance that he made. And the fucking crowd reception that he, that he got. You can't top that. That's a once in a lifetime fucking thing. Now the match that he had with Austin Aries. Was a better match than the one that he had with Zayn. Because the in-ring action was better. Austin Aries brought him to a better match. The match psychology to me. Was better. The Balor match with Nakamura. Was great. But. It could have been better if this was given more time. If this was built up for a world championship match on a takeover, we might be looking at match of the year. But don't downplay Balor's in-ring skill because he isn't in New Japan anymore. Give me a fucking break. Why? Because he's a WWE superstar now? And he, and he was molded into a WWE superstar? And he's learned the WWE way? He's learned not to overly do what he did in New Japan and use what he learned over there in a more confined way. I don't understand you people. You know, wrestling isn't Will Ospreay fucking acrobatics in a match. Yeah, that's great. I love that shit too. But for fucking 20 minutes, I don't need to see guys flying around all over the place risking life and limb. Balor does what he does better than most in the WWE. Better than most. Give the guy some fucking credit. As far as, as far as Finn Balor goes, he is the face of the WWE if they need somebody else to replace John Cena. It's not Roman Reigns. There's nobody on the main roster right now that even comes close to being a John Cena. Nobody. That includes Roman Reigns. And how can you trust Roman Reigns now that he failed a drug policy violation? You don't see John Cena failing drug policy violations. Give me a fucking break. John Cena would never fail a drug policy via... You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna retract that statement because I'm pretty sure John Cena is the most protected guy. He could probably get away with fucking killing somebody in WWE and they'd sweep that under the rug. But you guys know what I'm trying to say. John Cena is not going to go out there and blatantly do something to hurt his image as well as hurt the WWE's image. Roman Reigns hurt his image, took a step back, derailed his career for a little bit, lost money in the process, and he hurt the WWE's image. John Cena would never do that. John Cena wouldn't even think about doing that. So as far as I'm concerned, the next best guy, I thought it was Daniel Bryan, it should have been Daniel Bryan, when he was on the roster, actively, healthy, he was the one to take John Cena's spot. Daniel Bryan was the face of this company. In some ways, Daniel Bryan could come back and come out of retirement, and he would still be the face of the company. But we're talking about active WWE superstars. Finn Balor is that guy. He's got the look. He's got the marketability. He's just got the overall aura of what WWE looks for as far as a face. Balor is that guy. So for people to downplay Balor, he sucks, sucks in the ring. You people do not understand anything. You call me a smart mark. At least I have a fucking brain. At least I have eyes and I see more than what you're looking at. I don't know what the fuck you're watching. I really don't know what the fuck you're watching. Some of the shit I think some of these people say 
They just say it to simply say it. Balor has been fucking great. Give the guy some fucking credit. And again, I went off. I don't even know why we're talking about Roman Reigns. Who gives a shit about Roman Reigns? At this point, who gives a shit about Roman Reigns? I've said it for weeks. He doesn't even belong in the fucking main event at Battleground. But you can see how excited I am for guys like Balor and Joe and Zayn and Owens. The draft is going to be a fucking disaster. When it comes to those guys, it's going to help those guys the most. It's going to help those guys the most. And they're going to be on SmackDown. Guarantee you, all those guys on SmackDown. SmackDown is going to be fucking key. It's going to be the one night we're going to look at. And we're going to say, you know what? Wrestling ain't that bad. Monday nights is a completely different story. But Balor is destined for a massive push in WWE. He's a Triple H guy. Vince McMahon and other WWE officials are aware of that. Okay? Finn Balor is expected to receive a massive push when it comes to WWE television, which is going to be another top spot that Reigns will have to fight for. Because Balor's coming up to the main roster. With the draft coming, Balor will be there. What his role will be, I don't know. Hopefully they concocted something that's going to be of importance to him because he is that important. He is going to be that important. So when Roman Reigns comes back, it might not directly affect him because they're going to be on separate brands, I hope. I don't want Balor on Monday Night Raw. I don't even want to think about the sounds of Finn Balor being in the ring and having Michael Cole call his matches. Fuck that. Fuck that. Balor needs to be on SmackDown with Ronaldo calling his matches. Because that's what we all want. But it's not going to directly, uh, directly affect Roman Reigns here. Because they're probably going to be on two different brands. But as far as Vince McMahon's thinking and who he has on his list, Roman Reigns might be sliding down that list with the introduction of a, of a Balor and a Rollins and a Styles, you know? Roman Reigns may be fourth or fifth from the top now. Whereas before the drug policy, he was number one. So, I don't know. Not to mention the other men in NXT like Samoa Joe, Nakamura, and others that will demand top spots on WWE programming when they come to the main roster at the draft or later this year. Becoming the guy in WWE again... Could be too difficult for Roman Reigns if Vince McMahon is sour to him at this pivotal time for WWE programming. It's very likely that Reigns will be taking a backseat for the foreseeable future when he returns. Roman will need to work twice as hard to regain his position in WWE, especially with the WWE Universe against him the way that they have been for over a year and a half. WWE is going to be a different place for Roman Reigns when he returns right before Battleground. So... I don't know what to think of this. Like I always say, and I jokingly say it, take this with a grain of salt. You know, we all know Roman Reigns is Vince McMahon's guy. We've all heard the reports that Triple H has been very adamant about pushing Roman Reigns as well. So Roman Reigns, the guy could be seen at 2.0, not only in the ring and, and, and the way they built his character, but backstage politically as well. He could be on that John Cena type level. Anything that this guy does wrong will automatically be swept underneath the rug. And that's not right. That's not right for WWE. It's not right for Roman Reigns. It's not right for the fucking locker room. I don't like to see that type of behavior at all. If I was in charge, Roman Reigns would have to prove himself, not, in, not only in the ring, but backstage. Become a leader. Be more vocal about your fucking position in the company. Obviously, you go out there and walk through that fucking curtain every single week, and you know what they're giving you is not working. You go out there willingly, doing what these guys want, knowing in the back of your mind it is not working. So you know the first thing that I attribute that to? Okay, I'm the WWE champion, I'm making money, I'm all about the fame and the fortune. I don't give a shit about the fucking company. I don't give a shit about... My career. My legacy. What legacy does Roman Reigns have? He's a fucking four-time WWE champion already. What legacy has he established for himself? Nothing. 
Roman Reigns is known in three years for being a failure. The guy people willingly love to hate. And for the wrong reasons. They hate him for the wrong reasons. You need to push this guy out there. You need to have him walk through the curtain and have them hate him for the right reasons. Hate him because he is doing his job correctly. Don't hate him because he's Vince McMahon's fucking ass kisser. Or he's jerking Triple H off as they're walking down the block to fucking go get a nice coffee at Starbucks. Give me a break. You guys don't get it. You guys don't understand. You automatically attribute JD to hating Roman Reigns. I don't hate Roman Reigns. I hate the fact that WWE has not treated someone with all this potential right. And they don't listen. They don't understand what is out there in every arena, on every show. Why are you blind and deaf to what is going on? If this guy does not come back and he is not given a full-fledged heel turn, I give up hope. I give up hope. WWE is going to turn right back around and give him the fucking title because this is who they want. They want Roman's pretty beard and his fucking flowing black hair and his pretty looks and his oiled muscles. They want him to sit on fucking Michael and Kelly. They want him on these fucking late night talk shows. Meanwhile, the people with a brain, me, and the people watching me, and most of the fucking people watching the product who aren't of the age of seven and have a vagina... They know he's not right for that role. They know he is not the right one. So who is? Who is? That's WWE's fault that they have not created new stars. They can look themselves in the fucking mirror. They have not established anybody on their programming as a top star outside of Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Dean Ambrose. That's three guys out of a fucking roster of over a hundred and fucking thirty. That's laziness. That's the shit that pisses me off as a WWE fan. To see this company gleaming with talent that WWE willingly throws to the wayside because, oh yeah, they're on the roster. We got them. They're not going anywhere. You handcuff the fucking talent. Free the chains. Let these guys go out there and give you professional wrestling. Don't script their promos. Don't throw them out there and make them look like clowns. Don't insult our intelligence. If there's one thing we learned from TNA and the final deletion is that wrestling should be fun. Wrestling should be an outlet for creativity. WWE does not let anyone be creative. There's only so much creativity that could come from a 73-year-old mind. Yeah, he's got access to social media. Yeah, he's on the internet. But he's not in tune with what people my age want to see. At least TNA and Dixie Carter let Jeff and Matt Hardy be creative. If WWE only took a page from that book and applied it to their own program... WWE might be in a better place than we are now. And that's a fact. 100% fact. That's the shit that bothers me. That's why I get so animated and so pissed. And I rant. Because I see the potential in WWE. I see potential in Roman Reigns. But because Vince McMahon, a 73-year-old mind thinks he's creative and thinks he's doing the right thing and doesn't want to listen to anything else and wants to remain in his little bubble. You need help. Nobody can get ahead in this world without help. Yeah, you might be the number one company, the big dog in, in the wrestling world. You didn't get there without help. Your superstars 
the people that will be the building blocks for your company's future need help. They can't do it with Vince McMahon barking out orders and having him be the only one doing it. These guys are in this business to make money, to make a name for themselves, be creative and have fun. Being creative and having fun doesn't apply to WWE. And I can see it. I can see it. Every interview that happens after these guys are let go from the company, they all say the same thing. And they all act the same way. Soon as the fucking ball and chain is let go, they're allowed to be creative. Why is there such a lack of creativity in WWE? Why is there such ignorance in WWE? I don't get it. I just don't get it. And this Roman Reigns issue is everything I just talked about. I'll believe it when I see it. Vince McMahon is no longer high on Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns may be high on something else, but Vince McMahon apparently is no longer high on Roman Reigns. We'll see what happens at Battleground. Because there's rumors already that Dean Ambrose is going to drop the title. That would be another fucking mistake. Just like the rumor of Enzo and Cass being split away, and the New Day being split away via the WWE Draft. This would be another fucking mistake. Taking the title off Ambrose already? For what? To give it right back to a fucking drug policy violator? Who lost your trust? Who doesn't deserve it? Who ruined his spot at the top? For a few puffs? For a few painkillers? It's not who I want leading my company. Dean Ambrose has been a fucking model WWE champion in one month. Cut the best promo of his, of his entire fucking career. Against Seth Rollins on Monday Night Raw. Hasn't even given a chance yet. Give the guy a fucking chance. He doesn't deserve to drop the title back to Roman Reigns because he isn't the guy. Fuck that. Give Dean Ambrose a chance. You gave Punk a chance. You gave Brian a chance. There's no reason why Dean Ambrose should be void of having a run with the WWE Championship. I don't even know what else I want to talk about. There's really no other news. There's really no other news here. I'll go over this very very quickly. Speaking of the New Day. New Day versus the Wyatt Family, official for Battleground in a non-title match. Last night, or this week I should say, last night. I'm reading it because I pulled it on Monday. Last night on Raw, or this week on Raw, the New Day came to the Wyatt Family compound, which was essential, was, which was essentially, I should say, a muddy field, that turned into a war zone between the two stables. Which was ultimately won by the Wyatt family. The actual fight was a stalemate. When the fighting stopped, the New Day saw that there were dozens of others watching the fight from all around. A.K.A. Fireflies. As Bray Wyatt laughed, the New Day learned who they really are dealing with. But that was before the match was made official by WWE. It was revealed this week, earlier on WWE.com that the New Day are having a match with the Wyatts at Battleground next weekend, but it will not be for the WWE World Tag Team Championship. That may be a saving grace for the New Day because the Wyatts have gotten deeper into the skin of the Tag Team Champions than has anyone else before. Obviously, this is a way to extend the New Day's title reign to SummerSlam, but the WWE Draft has a strong chance of separating the New Day and the Wyatt family. Will their feud end at Battleground? Now, going into this, people were already talking about the Wyatt family taking the belts off of the New Day. And I didn't want that to happen. Because I've been pushing for Enzo and Cass to take the belts off the New Day at SummerSlam. They're already going in there with a hero's welcome before they even walk through the curtain. The place is going to explode when they come out. The place is going to even explode harder when they win the Tag Team Championships. And the New Day will have it for pretty much a whole year at that point. I think it's worth it. I think Enzo and Cass are worth that weight. Now, for the Wyatt Family versus the New Day, I talked about this on Monday Night Raw. And it was towards the very end of my Monday Night Raw review. I don't understand all the hate about this fucking WWE copying TNA. And we went over this on Out of Nowhere with Joe Cronin and myself. And Joe was very upset about it, rightfully so, because he's a fan 
a big fan of this gimmick, of this storyline, the final deletion. Why are TNA faithful, TNA elitists, the people that live and die by the sword of TNA, why are you upset that WWE copied this fucking storyline? They really didn't copy the storyline. They copied the makeup of the storyline. It was completely different. Broken Matt and Bray Wyatt are two completely different fucking entities. And I went over this on Monday night. I went over this in my Raw review. I don't want to repeat it again, but some guys here, some of you watching, might not have heard it. So I'm going to go over it again in brief. Bray Wyatt to WWE is a little bit more flexible as character goes. Bray Wyatt is the type of character that you could see in a fucking Silence of the Lambs type fucking movie. That's how fucking sick and demented he comes off. That's how great of a character he plays. Broken Matt is Matt Hardy. The Matt Hardy that we know from the Hardy Boys. Jeff's brother. He's broken and has completely gone insane because he has to live with the fact that people are always putting him in second place. People always thought Jeff was the number one Hardy Boy. Now Matt went insane at that thought. That's why he's broken. But now, the way we see it, he's developed a character for himself that is going to last the remainder of his career. And that's a great thing. And the reason why this came to be, the final deletion, is because TNA let these guys go out there, like I just said, talking about Roman Reigns, without a fucking leash. Dixie Carter let these guys do what they wanted to do. With no fucking entity or no other outwardly worldly sources to fucking dictate what they need to do. They went out there and had fun. And that's what the final deletion was. Dixie gave these guys an outlet to be creative. As long as it brought eyes to the company. Because everybody loves the Hardy Boys. And that's exactly what happened. They brought eyes to the company. They got more people talking about TNA in 2016. A company that we thought was fucking dead. Than the last couple of years. That alone is a success. Not only do you got the fucking internet talking and the wrestling world talking, you got WWE looking at your fucking content. You got WWE eyeing your storyline. So why are TNA faithful and TNA elitists upset that WWE is copying? I don't understand you people. Look at this as a success. TNA was never competition to WWE. They don't even mention TNA on their programming. Never. They will never mention TNA on their programming. They've always made it a point to mention that TNA is not direct competition. But if they're not direct competition, why are you jacking their ideas and trying to make it your own? So they must be competition then. That's just the way I see it. You got WWE jacking your ideas. You get an A+, plus, my friend. Your report card is going to read A+. Plus. If Matt and Jeff Hardy were graded as a fucking 8th eighth, eighth, eighth grade student, right? They'd get an A+. Plus. Right then and there. Boom. Pass the test with flying colors. They got WWE talking. Now, comparing the two, the final deletion was better. Because we all let loose and we didn't take it seriously. WWE made this storyline with the New Day and the Wyatts serious. The entire vibe of the compound was serious. What was underneath all the fucking theatrics and the sound effects and the lighting and all this other bullshit that they put into the production. Underneath that was a match that I genuinely wanted to see. How I would have handled it is I would have had the New Day, segment by segment, storyline, working up to getting to the compound, how they're getting ready, how they're men mentally preparing for the compound, what the Wyatts are doing at the compound, 
what they're going to be greeting the new day with when they finally step foot on the compound. This all should have led up to Battleground. The compound match should have been at Battleground if this was going to be a non-title match. If in the end this was going to be a non-title match, it should have been a compound match. Six on six. Or three on three, rather. Six-man tag. I don't want to see any more six-man... Six on six. Jesus fucking Christ. No way. Three on three. Six-man tag. That's what it should have been at Battleground. The compound match should have been at Battleground. And the way that they should have did the compound match should have been the blueprint for what they did back in the day with Mankind and The Undertaker inside the Boiler Room Brawl. Or what Solomonster mentioned on his podcast with Ken Shamrock and Owen Hart in the fucking Lion's Den match that they had at the fucking Hart Family Dungeon. Remember that? He brought that up on the fucking podcast this Sunday. I didn't even realize that match was, was fucking around. He brought back memories mentioned in that fucking match. It should have been raw. It should have been unedited. It should have been the New Day out of their element. With the environment that the Wyatt family's character thrives in. That they were born from. That would have been great. But WWE had to cheese it up. They had to go over the top to prove a fucking point. Oh, we're better than TNA. We can do this better than Matt and Jeff. No, you didn't. You didn't. It was all fucking overhyped production. And WWE has top-notch production. But they made it seem as if... They needed to do it better, and they went way over the top. And the final deletion ended up coming out looking better. Because WWE, seen this, they wanted to capitalize off what TNA was doing, and they don't consider TNA, they don't consider TNA competition though, right? So if they're not competition, why are you stealing their ideas? You mean to tell me you got 30 creative writers plus Mr. Senile Dementia himself, Vince McMahon? You can't think and concoct your own ideas, right? Yeah, but WWE's creative though, right? Creative writing. Creative writing, my fucking balls. Creative writing, but you're jacking TNA's ideas. TNA lucked out in the end. TNA won this. TNA should be thanking them that they stole the idea because now TNA and everybody, including Bray Wyatt and Sasha Banks and their superstars, are talking about this on social media. Who won in the end? It wasn't the New Day wasn't the Wyatts, it was TNA, and Broken Matt Hardy, that's who won, but there's not a title match, I'm glad it's not a title match, in the end, Wyatt family can get a win, solidify some nice momentum for themselves, New Day can be on the receiving end of a loss, not look that bad, going into SummerSlam, maybe keep that momentum a little bit, they don't need to, over they don't need to win here, and then they could go into SummerSlam and lose the titles, and then if Vince McMahon wants to break them up, which I wouldn't do, there, you got a reason to break them up. Because they lost to the Wyatts, they lost the tag team titles, they lost the tag team di titles because of the repercussions of the feud with the Wyatt family. So be it. There you got it. That's my review, that's my news, and that's off the script for part one. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I went on some rants, but I'm very pleased with this episode, man. I was, even though I'm sick, I'm thinking straight. I have a lot of ideas up here. And a lot of things I want to say about the product. And I'm very happy with the way it came out here. Very direct. Logic. And that's what we like to do here, man. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed the podcast this week. Part one. I'll be back with more news and rumors. It's been a slow week. Started off pretty hot. Monday and Tuesday kind of died off. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But I have more news coming on into part two. We got a few between Randy Orton and Chris Jericho could be starting at Battleground. Uh, that could be Randy Orton's next feud coming out of the Lesnar match at SummerSlam. Charlotte and Dana Brooke versus Sasha Banks and a mystery partner has been announced for Battleground. Everybody's talking about it being Bayley. We'll go over that. We got news on that. Lesnar made $8 million for the fight at UFC 200. Holy shit. Backstage concern that Vince McMahon will sour on Finn Balor. Don't know why. Again, take that one with a grain of salt. Is Vince McMahon interested in selling UFC? Or, I'm sorry, selling UFC. Is Vince McMahon interested in selling WWE? After the UFC deal. Triple H lowballing WWE superstars on new deals could lead to more releases before SummerSlam. And Eric Bischoff reportedly will not be returning to WWE. All that plus so much more on Off the Script. 
Let me know what you guys are thinking down below of everything that we discussed here. Make sure you subscribe to my buddy Sean's channel. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Barbershop window. Get your t-shirts for the summer months. Thank you so much, everybody that bought a t-shirt this week. Twitter, JD from NY206. Subscribe to the channel. Make sure you guys check out my videos from this week, the Cruiserweight Classic. I got an NXT video coming up at 4 o'clock today. Make sure you guys wait for that. And I'll be back, as always, with part two of the number one fucking source right here on YouTube.com for everything WWE. I'm JD. This is Off the Script. And I'll see you guys right back here on Saturday morning for part two. I'll talk to you later.